Hello, I'm Pastor Sam Walsh from the Princeton Advent Christian Church, and I want to be your pastor too. As wonderful as it is to be a Mountaineer fan and to enjoy the West Virginia mountains, it's even greater to know that we can take our stand on Jesus Christ. And even when the football team doesn't do so well, we can be equipped with the full armor of God to take our stand for what really matters for all eternity. Join us for this part one of the Armor of God. Thank you. Our scripture reading comes from the book of Ephesians, chapter 6, verses 10 through 14. It will be a familiar passage to you because we're looking at the Armor of God passage. It really characterizes the end of Ephesians. So let's just get right into it. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm, then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with a breastplate of righteousness in place, and then it continues after that. As you know, we passed through basic training last week, and now we get to go into the armory or the armor of God today. And uh, we find here two of the armor of God to put on today, and our command is to put it on. So you may also remember uh, back not too long ago, movies came out uh, uh, with the uh, title of the Chronicles of Narnia, and of course that put into motion picture uh, the... Uh, the books that were written by C.S. Lewis back in the middle of the 20th century. And uh, in those books, which were really written for children, and uh, the Pevensey children went through a wardrobe in a game of hide-and-seek they were playing and ended up in the snowbound country of Narnia. You may remember that uh, story or the movie like that. And C.S. Lewis wrote how they encountered there a wicked witch who ruled over the whole land of Narnia and had set a spell over it so that it was always winter, but never Christmas. However, as the story progresses, the lion, Aslan, starts to come back to the land of Narnia, and as the creator of the world, and as he draws near, the spell of the witch begins to break, and the four children form part of that prophecy that they will overthrow this wicked witch with the lion Aslan's help, and they will reign as kings and queens of Narnia. It is, of course, a parable that you should explore. As the story continues, the children are trudging through the snow, and it's very high snow, and they're following after a beaver at some point, who is Mr. Beaver is taking them to see Aslan, and they hear sleigh bells. And here along in the snow comes St. Nicholas. Uh, of course, he would say uh, St. Nicholas is Santa Claus and like that. And Santa Claus has broken through the winter and arrives there with some presents for the children. Now the children are overjoyed to see Santa Claus come, but the gifts that he gives to them are very unexpected, unlike anything that they would have thought they would receive. They're actually very daunting weapons of war, a sharp sword for Peter, a real bow and quiver full of sharp arrows for the second-born Lucy, uh, Susan, sorry, we'll get to Lucy next. A dagger is given to the little girl, Lucy, and a bottle of healing potion in the story. These are not the kind of gifts 
that we would hand out to our little children at our church Christmas party, are they? <laughs> Not quite. Of course, that is exactly the effect that C.S. Lewis was hoping to convey. Children uh, is a great image to think about Christians as we are equipped with a powerful armor of God in order to withstand the spiritual battle and, and withstand in the spiritual realm, sometimes we are quite unaware that we are warriors, warrior children. It's a really apt illustration. But we are also like little children in that we feel completely dependent upon Jesus. We can't do it ourselves. In fact, we find out in our passage that the spiritual armor of God is a gracious gift from Jesus Christ. So using the symbol of a Roman soldier, the Bible tells us that we need to be equipped with the armor of God. We need to be equipped with the spiritual qualities that are found in Jesus Christ. So in our text today, we need to put on the belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness. I hope this shows up. It should be a Roman soldier. Okay. We'll come back to that. But here we blow up, put on the belt of truth. All right. The symbol of the belt is really an Old Testament idea right from the book of Isaiah and chapter 11. There the passage is a prophecy about Jesus Christ, that he is the branch, that he is the shoot coming up from the stump of Jesse, and he is filled with the Spirit of the Lord. But then it goes into Isaiah chapter 11, verse 5, which says, Righteousness will be his belt, and faithfulness the sash around his waist. So in Isaiah 11, the armor of God belongs to Jesus Christ, and it is the clothing of the Messiah. Now, when the Apostle Paul uses it in the book of Ephesians, he applies that armor of God, God's armor, to you. To you. And this is really a remarkable step. We put on Christ, not just putting on the armor, but we put on Christ as it is. Jesus is the truth. And we are allowed to put on the belt of truth. What is said of Christ is then applied to you and to me and to us. Jesus gives us the truth and we are united to Christ because he is the truth. The idea of truth. Pilate asked a long time ago to Jesus, what is truth? Or we could say it even worse, right? What is truth? in kind of his despair. We don't have the inflection. The world is still ridiculing the idea of truth today. Truth? Can it really be true that there is one truth for all people, for all time, in every circumstance, in every situation? That's almost unheard of for our generation. We're so familiar with the idea of differences of perspective, and those are real. We look at things from different perspectives. We're so familiar with the idea that, oh, you can have your belief and you this one and this and that, and we're all together here and we're believing different things and we all believe it's true. And, and we're familiar with differences of opinion. Well, you have your opinion, I have my opinion. We're so familiar with all of that that we're tempted to retreat as it were, into a little shell and say, oh, you can have your truth, but I'll have my truth. Don't bother me here. But that's not what happens. Don't go that way. The belt of truth is for all to see. It's out in front of us. It's holding everything together. Truth in the biblical sense is more than opinion. Would you agree? Yes. Mm. It is the inexplicable. <laughs> inescapable conclusion, can't get around it, that what God says is right, no matter what, in any place, any time, for everywhere. You think about the life of Jesus. Jesus made some outrageous claims. Think about those claims that he made. He claimed the ability to forgive sins. 
Now, you have to remember, in those days, the only place that you got forgiveness of sins was at the temple by offering animal sacrifice. And Jesus, right in Capernaum, said, you are forgiven to the paralytic, came down through the roof. And then he backed it up by healing the man. Jesus made some outrageous claims, but he could back them up. Either he forgave sins or he did not. There is no way around this. Either what he says is right or we're not even going to say it. <laughs> Jesus claimed that he could rise from the dead, and he did. And he appeared to more than 500 people. They were witnesses after his resurrection. He claimed that he would return for us in power and great glory. He backed everything else up. Do you believe he's coming back? Yeah. Amen. Jesus told the truth because he is the truth. There just is no room for you have your truth and I'll have my truth. No, no. Either we are forgiven by Jesus Christ or we are not forgiven of our sins. Just as 2 plus 2 equals 4, either he is your Savior or you're living as if Jesus lied to you. Either he is king, or he is not, and you'll remember the phrase, he is Lord over all, or he is not Lord at all. Got to catch up here. Okay. All right. The second aspect <laughs> is that we put on Jesus. We put on Jesus. The belt of truth is protection. A belt keeps everything tucked in place, by the way. I'm wearing a belt today. You don't have to worry about those preacher stories. There are no loose ends because we're getting everything tucked in. And this is the way it is with Scripture. Scripture is truth, so everything is tucked into place. There are no contradictions in God's Word. Our politicians are full of contradictions. Our schools are full of, uh, full of contradictions. Well, you can do this this time, but you can't do it then. Even my life has contradictions in your life at times. But there is no contradiction in the Word of God. There is no contradiction in Jesus Christ. Praise God. we got real protection. One writer, R.C. Sproul, wrote about the Roman soldier's leather belt here. I'll just write what, read what he said. It supported and protected his lower abdomen, gathered his tunic together, held his sword. Paul seems to have in mind the confidence that comes from certainty about the truthfulness of God's word. I think that's right. But along the same lines, a soldier has got to take orders from a commander. And we don't need to wonder if God is going to tell us the truth when we're out there on the front lines or not. We can't be questioning orders. You can't be worried if maybe, maybe my commander is not going to tell me what's right. We can believe God's word. We can trust his commands for us. We can obey. And in the time of combat, you need to hear the truth and you need to act on it right away. And that protects you. Then third... Okay, I'm caught up now. Truth keeps us from the error of doctrine or from wrong thinking. Life is too short to get sidetracked with opinion. We want to follow Jesus Christ, and then we're staying with the truth. Now, you know, I know it's fun to explore different opinions and read different ways, but just as the belt is strong and it's reliable and all that, the truth is reliable, and it's going to hold us up in the tough times of life where opinions are going to let us down. And then this third aspect will be true. We will have integrity also in our witness because of the truth. You will be the faithful, reliable people out there that are going to tell the truth. Others can count on you because you're consistent or more consistent than much of the world. And then we're going to be able to speak the truth in love, they go together. We don't want to have one without the other. So we're going to be honest. And in the church, that means that uh, 
We're going to grow up into Christ Jesus, into his truth. We're going to become mature. The belt of truth helps us to become Christ-like. Okay, it's time for illustration. You remember back into elementary school, and, the, well, at, I remember in elementary school, the third grade, the teacher sat us down in a circle in the classroom and said, okay, now we're going to play a game. We're going to play the telephone game. Remember the telephone game, how fun that is? And the teacher explained it to us very carefully. Oh, she, she's going to say something to the student right next to her, and then that student's going to whisper it in the next person's ear, and it's going to go right around and right around and right around, and then the last person is going to whisper it back to the teacher. And the message will be perfectly conveyed all the time, right? Well, you know, of course, what's going to happen. And uh, so as we sat in the circle and repeated one to another, the message changed <laughs> as it got around to me. And I was like, I don't even know what you're saying. Oh, just say it. Okay. Uh, and you go on from there. So that when it got around, I don't really remember what it was that we were talking about. But if we started talking out about a dog with a brown collar, it ended up as a cat living in a holler. <laughs> I mean, you, you just get very far away from the truth very quickly. <laughs> truth is important. Accurate communication is essential. We kind of got the lesson on that. And here it is. We have to have integrity in our witness out on the line so we communicate the truth. Remember, we're side by side with other soldiers in the army here taking our stand. We've got to rely on orders, not be deceived, have to take a stand on what's true. Now the world, as I said, is filled with all kinds of commentary, all kinds of opinion, but with the belt of truth, you have something worthwhile to say. <laughs> There's a lot of people that really shouldn't be talking about their opinions. <laughs> but you have something to say. The apostles were willing to lay down their lives for the truth of the gospel. You have the facts of the truth, and that is that Jesus lived a sinless, perfect life for you. That's the truth. You have the facts of the truth. He took the penalty of your sin by dying on the cross for you, for you. And he rose again on the third day and appeared to more than 500 people at the same time. This is the truth. This is true that he's coming back. To be with you forevermore. This is good news. And this is what you have to share as witnesses. The voice of truth. And the truth shines forth like this candle in a dark spot. And when others don't have hope, they can see your light shining even before you say it. Have you been to Gettysburg, Pennsylvania? All right, some of you, yeah. Yeah, I don't remember the number of times I've been there. I like it so much going there. Been across uh, the field, pickets charge two times with a, a ranger taking us across. Uh, actually, I talked with Don Whitaker about that. Yeah. He'd been across there too. And he told me where he, what happened. Where he, I know just the spot where he fell in the reenactment. I've been there. Largest battle of the Civil War took place three days before July 4th, 1863. One of the pivotal moments of the battle actually didn't take place on the third day at all. It took place on the far end of the Union line on Little Round Top, second day. One regiment from the state of Maine, way up north, was led by a college professor named Joshua Chamberlain. The college professor, he was told at his regiment on the end, you got to stand here. The battle was way over there. Nobody was around. But he said, they said to him, you have to stay here no matter what. You have to stay. You can't move. You can't retreat. If they come with overwhelming numbers, you have to stay and be lost. And they got the point. At first, they're all alone, all out in the woods. Nothing happened. They seemed very unimportant. But they believed the truth of their orders, and they stayed put. 
for hours and hours and hours. They believed it, and they just stayed there, out in the forest, out in the woods. They heard the cannons, they heard the gunfire on the other side of the hill, but they stayed there because they believed the truth of the commander, their orders. But things began to change after a while, and the Confederates realized that there was an opportunity to go around that hill, around the battle, and put a block between uh, the Army and Washington, D.C. And they almost got around that hill. They were very close. But they came up against Joshua uh, Chamberlain's uh, regiment sitting there on the top of the hill. And they came, waves upon waves, right their way up the hill toward the 20th Main, right toward that high position behind the stone wall. I've been there, crouched behind it. The place looks just like where I walk the dogs out in Princeton City Park, out on those trails, just like that. The 20th Maine obeyed their orders. The battle came their way, and they stood the ground, and the war changed at that point. They probably saved the United States of America from being permanently divided into two countries. That's how pivotal it was that they took their stand. How did they do that? They believed the truth of their orders. The belt of truth will also hold your life together in a time of battle with integrity. The belt of truth will hold our church together in a time of battle because Jesus is the way. He is the truth and the life. Thank you. And that truth in Christ Jesus is something for which I'm prepared to take my stand and even lose my life for. Amen. You're going to have to decide. Opinions can change. Feelings can flip-flop. But you're going to live a life of integrity. You have to have something firm to stand on. You want to stand on the belt of, with the belt of truth, which is Jesus Christ, wrapped around you. All right. I'm going to go on. So I'm trying to cover two of these armor pieces today. Truth and righteousness are really closely related Justice is turned back, and righteousness stands far away. For truth has stumbled in the public square, and uprightness cannot enter. Was that Isaiah writing yesterday? No. <laughs> 2,700 years ago, it sounds just like it should be uh, on today's headlines. Isaiah continues, The Lord saw it and was displeased, and there was no justice. In Isaiah, the Lord saw there was no justice, no one to intercede, so he himself took action and put on the armor of God. And then we read in Isaiah 59, 17, he put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation uh, on his head. He put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself in zeal as a cloak. The armor of God, see, is an Old Testament idea but it's applied to the Lord God himself. And as New Testament Christians, we are now equipped with the same armor that God has. That's how powerful this is. So we have Ephesians 6.14. Stand firm then. And we reiterated that last week. That was part of our basic training. Stand firm, stand firm. Four times we found it. With the belt of truth, buckle around the waist, and with the breastplate of righteousness in place. So the second part of our armor is to put on the breastplate of righteousness. Uh, this is kind of like steel, and leather holds it together. The breastplate is, we would say, our bulletproof vest. Let me just put it into modern terms. The steel armor is protecting the upper body. The righteousness Get this, the righteousness of Jesus Christ protects the Christian believer against deceit and attacks that come from the other side, the evil one, and against crushing oppression and opponents. So first, we have, uh, we have to distinguish between 
extrinsic righteousness and intrinsic righteousness. Bear with me on that. They're just big words. But our intrinsic righteousness is not enough, not strong enough. What I mean is that there are weaknesses in your own righteousness, unless you have Jesus Christ. There's going to be some weak points. There are in mine. We aren't perfect. We sin. We know this. We fall short of the glory of God. We may try real hard, but if we tried to take our stand in our own righteousness, we would end up getting poked really hard because there's some holes in our armor, but not in the armor of Jesus Christ. So we get an upgrade by trading in our faulty righteousness and we receive the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ. We leave behind our clothing and we put on Christ. That's where we have the extrinsic righteousness. Jesus' righteousness comes to us. In other words, imputed righteousness. You don't have to know all that, but for further study, look it up. We are declared righteous by faith, not because we've earned it ourselves. That's all it's saying. And how does that help? Well, that protects in a mighty way. Because you and I, if I read you right, you're always going to remember some sins of yours. And we might be able to forget other people's sins, but it's hard to forget our own sins. Even if we receive forgiveness, we're going to remember sometimes where we fail. And when those sins come back to haunt us, and when those shortcomings come up against us, and our failings before the Lord come against us, the devil stirs all of those up in our minds and say, hey, remember that, remember that, remember that. At least he does in mine. Or something happens in mine. Thoughts come in like, God can't possibly use you. You're not good enough for God. That's what I hear. Or worse, sometimes, God must be out to get you. That's not the Lord. That's not God. And that's when we need to put on the breastplate of Christ's righteousness. Because those doubts and those fears are going to pierce through our own faulty righteousness and make us weaklings. And we're going to be scared to take our stand. We're not going to do it. We're going to be convinced we're failing. So we're not going to go out and do it. We're not going to go out and witness. We're not going to stand with the belt of truth with this. But then we find out from the gospel that Jesus' righteousness is applied to us. And it is perfect, no holes, no weaknesses. And his righteousness is applied so that when you doubt and when you are afraid, or when you think you're just not worthy of God's kingdom, you can remember, yes, Christ died for me. The Bible tells me that. Christ died to save me. And God sees only the righteousness of Jesus Christ when he looks at you, when he looks at me. <sighs> now I'm prepared for the battle. The cross, the sign of execution in the Roman world, now becomes our righteousness in Jesus Christ. We are declared righteous through faith, right? As it says in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. So when you, at that point, you no longer have to worry about being good enough for God to save you. Now you're free to take your stand, because he has saved you. He's going to save you forevermore. The righteousness of Christ applies to you and protects you, and we can stand in that righteousness. So when the devil threatens you with lies and threats and tries to get you to give up, you can say, even like Luther used to say, yes, I know, devil, that I'm not worthy to, to stand in myself, but Christ has given me his righteousness, and I am worthy because I'm declared righteous by Jesus Christ. By faith, you can make that faith commitment today. And then a wonderful thing takes place. Then we become concerned in a right way about holiness and righteous living for the right reasons. Not trying to impress God, but just, or not to, to, to prove that God anything. Instead, we're living in the new life of Christ, and it's better than the old way, and I want to live in the new. We want to take our stand with the Lord against evil. We want to take our stand for justice. 
in our community and for the oppressed people have somebody to come alongside and we protect them. We work for the poor and the weak, the unborn children that can't defend themselves and the others. We love holiness. We have a goal. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things be added to you. You stand up for what is right, you protect others, you love holiness, and you put on the bulletproof vest of Christ's righteousness. My aim this morning has been to inspire you just a little bit to live up to the new life in Christ, because it's better than the old way. Don't be defeated by discouragement. Don't be defeated by disappointment with other people. And don't let circumstances keep you from being a Christian warrior. And don't let your feelings rule you. You have to go back to, yeah, I may not feel like a warrior, but this is what Jesus says. Take a stand for truth and righteousness. People need to know the truth, and they need to see it lived out in your life. Righteous life. In the new life. Put on the armor of God to take your stand every day in the new life in Christ Jesus. Let's bow in prayer.